This episode of Take It to the Board was recorded prior to the tragic events in Surfside, Florida. Our hearts are with the families and first responders during this difficult time. If you would like to support the ongoing efforts, please visit www.supportsurfside.org. Hi, everyone. I'm attorney Donna DiMaggio Berger, and this is Take It to the Board, where we speak condo and HOA. Every year, I teach dozens of specialized classes for board members and managers, and no matter what the subject matter of a particular class is, when I open up the class to discussion, most of the questions concern service animal and emotional support animal requests. This has been the case for years, and I'm delighted today to have on as a guest my partner, Joanne Nesta Burnett. Joanne has defended numerous community associations who have been on the receiving end of discrimination complaints related to their denial of a request for an ESA or service animal. She's been my go-to person for years when my clients need to evaluate the legitimacy of the accommodation request they receive. Joanne, welcome to Take It to the Board. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy you're here. So Joanne, let's start with some basics. For a condominium, cooperative, or homeowners association, which law applies? The Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, or the Fair Housing Act? because we've got clients that kind of throw around those words uh, indiscriminately. And what are the fundamental differences between those two laws? Uh, The Americans with Disabilities Act, um, the ADA, that governs places of public accommodation. So it can apply in certain situations, but usually doesn't. Um, It applies to uh, places within the community that might be open to the public. So if an association allows swim meets at its pool if it allows, uh, you know, parties at its clubhouse, things like that, those places could be governed by the ADA. But generally speaking, um, these our associations are governed by the Fair Housing Act. And the Fair Housing Act, um, under the ADA, they only recognize service animals, and that has to be a dog. Um, under the Fair Housing Act, Pretty much anything goes. It can be any kind of animal, any breed, any size, any weight. You name it, we can have it. So service animals, miniature horses too? Yes, miniature po- Yes, miniature ponies. Although I have to say, I've never seen that. I did see a news report about a miniature pony on a plane, <laughs> but I don't have one yet in my communities. It's, you touched on, you touched on the, the emotional support animals can really be anything. Yes. Um, I know I read about emotional support alligator in a community, which is just wild. But personally speaking, what's the craziest emotional support animal request you've gotten? I had about two years ago, I had a request for 28 sheep and two goats. (laughs) Wait, Um, 28 (laughs) sheep and two goats. What was the size of the dwelling? It's a very large, you know, uh, rural community, but... (laughs) And, and believe it or not, the person registered every one of those animals with one of the online registries. So spent, you know, $5,000 just to register these animals. And we finally told him, you know, you can't have these. And, and he did remove them, but now he's moved on to beehives. So they're terrorizing the community right now, but we're working on that also. So, but with 28 sheep, were there 28 different functions that each of these animals performed? It was such an odd request. And no, it wasn't even alleged. <laughs> long, long story short, he, he wanted what he wanted. Exactly. Okay, and was hoping exactly. he could get it. So yes. to it, you and I and, I, and I didn't say this at the outset, you and I have worked together at Becker for a long time. But when we started, I don't remember ever hearing anything about emotional support animal or service animal requests in our communities. When did these requests first start becoming commonplace? I'm going to say about 15 years ago, Gary Polyakoff and I authored uh, an article called Prescription Pets. And that was the very beginning of this whole thing, you know, just getting way out of hand, you know, with all of these requests. But that was it, about 15 years ago. Oh, that's right. You were the author of that. That was a very catchy phrase. I think Gary trademarked that name. He Prescription did. Prescription Pets. He did. And in fact, I just looked it up, but I think it's it's um, defunct now. 
Yeah, I'm pretty sure he sent me a cease and desist at one point when I started using the term <laughs> prescription pets and said, uh, hey, I, that, you know, that's trademark. So so you are, as I said at the outset, Joey, and you're my, you're my go-to person with this. I mean, look, all of us as community association attorneys over the last few years, we've become very familiar with these type of requests, particularly in our communities that are either what they call no pet communities or pet restricted. And, you know, I know the mechanics, I know the basics. But you are the expert. How quickly can you tell if a request is fraudulent? And what are the red flags? Um, Almost immediately. At this point, because I have been doing this for so long, um, most of the people's names I can recognize, the letterhead, it gives it away. Um, They're usually good for one year, which is typically not what a doctor or someone who's actually triggering someone would write. That's come back in a year and pay me again. Um, it, it usually says I was assessed or evaluated. It doesn't say I treat. Uh, and, and like I said, I just know so many of the names when I see them. What about the, the letters that say, Mrs. Smith has been diagnosed with a disability pursuant to the, what is it? The D diagnostic manual DSM or DM. Mm-hmm. Uh, is that sufficient just to, but without naming what the disability is, just that yes. this person has a, 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 a disability. Is that good it, enough? It is good enough. Believe it or not, we are not entitled to an, a specific diagnosis. So that's one thing that a, a lot of communities get tripped up on is they'll ask specifically, what is your, what is your diagnosis? And we're not entitled to that information. But we are entitled to know what major life activities are impaired. Correct. Is that correct? Yes. And what would those major life activities be? So those are things like sleeping, eating, breathing, walking, talking, concentrating, focusing, socializing. Yeah. From the letters I see, Joanne, they rarely delve into that. So they'll say, this person is, is di- you, know, I'm, uh, you know, I've assessed this person. This person does meet the, the um, definition of disability and they need this animal without going into it. So if you get that kind of letter, what's your response? My response is that it does not comply with the requirements of the Fair Housing Act. It doesn't. It, it, uh, and a lot of times we'll get a letter that just says that it substantially limits one or more major life activities. But we are entitled to know which of those major life activities are impaired so we can determine if there is a nexus or a, a true need for the animal. Now, I notice when you when you write back on this and you're typically are you writing to the directly to the um, licensed medical professional asking for more advice or are you writing to the disabled person who's made this request? I write to the disabled person that's making the request, and that's generally because without a HIPAA release, the medical professional is not going to speak with me. So I generally just correspond with the person making the request unless I'm asked and to I contact know, them. And I notice that you typically use this language, that you are engaging in a meaningful dialogue with yes, them, in a meaningful interaction. Is that something you're required to say or... We're not required to say it, but we are required to do it. You are required to engage in the interactive process and open up a dialogue with the person. So a lot of times a community might say, you know, we got this letter. We know it's fraudulent. We're not going to accept it. We're denying it. And even if you get one of those letters that's purchased online, you should not deny the request outright. You need to engage in that interactive process and at least go back and, and request reliable documentation. How, how difficult is that to keep a straight face and engage in a meaningful dialogue when the request is outlandish like 28 sheep and two goats? Yeah, I'll be honest with you. When I, <laughs> <laughs> Just, and he, he had counsel too. So I'm <laughs> writing back to another attorney saying, what? <laughs> 28 sheep and two goats. That, you know, quite frankly, that's just unreasonable facially. So, you know, it, it can be difficult. But you're a, pro, you're a pro and you've got a lot of experience doing it. So we talked about major life, impaired major life activities. And I get this question all the time. So let's say that um, Mrs. Smith has, a, a, you know, met the, the legal litmus test, has a letter, a recent letter, let's say within the last year from a treating medical, licensed medical professional. And the licensed medical, medical professional says that she needs this particular animal to socialize. Okay, that's her major life activity. But every day, 
Mrs. Smith leaves the unit and leaves the dog in the unit yapping all day long. And she's out socializing. Now, can we go back and say, wait a second, this does not seem to, to uh, coincide here. You, you've, got a, you've got a letter that said you needed this animal to socialize. You appear to be socializing just fine without the animal. You know, we've, we've had situations like that where we will go back and question it. But for the most part, and this goes back to the law that governs these requests, if it's an emotional support animal, theoretically, they're not permitted in places of public accommodation. So they're not going to go to work with the owner. They're not going to go to publics with the owner. They're not going to do those kind of things. So they will be at home in the, in the home alone during the day or with someone else who might be there. Um, so it's not unreasonable that the animal would be there alone, but if their ability to socialize does not seem like it's truly impaired, um, there, there are limits and we, we might be able to go back and test those limits. For instance, if she's at the pool, <laughs> not working, not in Publix, at the pool right. yes. and yes. the dog is up in the unit, then. Yes. So, and, and that's a double-edged sword right there too, because, you know, you're saying she's at the pool, so many communities don't want the animals at the pool. So do you really want to to go back to her and say, why don't you have the dog at the pool? Right. Exactly. You know, I think we, we get that a lot too. People will say, well, we've got pet restrictions. Well, these animals are not treated legally in the eyes of the law as pets. They're extensions of their disabled humans. Is that right? That's right. And I always tell my clients, you know, think of it as a wheelchair. You're not going to tell someone they can't bring their wheelchair to the pool so you can't tell them they can't bring their emotional support animal or service animal to the pool. But Joanne, there has to be some areas they can't go. Where can't they go? It's very limited, but the areas that they're not permitted is in a kitchen where food is prepared. They can be in, you know, if you're in the clubhouse and you're eating, they can be where food is consumed, but not where it's prepared. And they're not allowed to go in the pool itself. They can't be in the water. What about the chairs? <laughs> Do Are they allowed to sit on the chairs in the I always say no. I say but, no also. Yeah, I mean, sitting on the chair in the, in the lobby or sitting on a pool chair, I mean, I would assume the animal can sit next to the person on the floor. Right. I always say that. Just the animal's not permitted on furniture. Because let's, you know, there's competing interest here, too. There's also people who purchase and move into pet-restricted or no-pet communities because A, they're traumatized and they, they've had a bad experience. They don't want to be around dogs, let's say, or cats. Um, they have allergies. Um, and, and, you know, in a multifamily building, I think this is especially critical because the common areas are really an extension of your home. Okay. You can't right. leave your unit and you're automatically outside. You got to walk down a corridor, get in an elevator, walk through a lobby, get out of the, you know, get out of the community. What do we say to those people? who say, but I bought in here and I can't be in an elevator with a dog. It freaks me out. Or I have an allergy. And, and HUD, the, the way that they've told us to address these is we are supposed to try to run interference between the two people. So if someone has allergies, try and keep them, you know, far on this side of the room and the person with the animal on the other side of the room. And it really doesn't make any sense. And, and in my opinion, in a lot of these situations, People that truly require animals are very um, conscientious about other people and, and coming in contact with those other people. Um, it's the people that, you know, try to get away with something that are generally the ones that, you know, don't care. I'm, I'm bringing my dog into the lobby and I'm putting it on the couch and I'm, you know, going to let it pee on the lobby floor and I'm not going to clean it up. But it, 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 it's, it's especially a problem in the elevators. The elevators are generally the biggest problem. Because so, would it be would it be appropriate with a rule saying, look, if you have your animal and the doors open, the passenger doors open up and there's people in there that you ask first, can I bring, you know, can we enter or is that would that be seen as discrimination against the disabled person? You know, I've never actually had to um have that addressed by HUD, but I believe that HUD I would probably think if it were the association asking um, or, or s requiring that, that they might find that discriminatory. But I think that's just being polite, quite frankly. Right. I, I, I would agree. What about aggressive breeds? So some people will say, OK, I get it. You, you want an emotional support animal. And I should preface this by saying, look, most of the abuse we see is in the area of these emotional support animals or ESAs, not with service animals. 
because service animals, look, we, we've all seen service animals. They are the animals that really don't pay attention to anybody else. They are trained. They won't even look at you. They're, they're, they're quiet. They're working with their disabled human and they have specific skills and training whether it's for mobility impairment, vision impairment, PTSD. Um, I had an uncle who had a seizure dog and he had the dog with him when he would drive and it would alert him if he was going to have a seizure, he would pull over. These are incredibly expensive and valuable animals. So uh, there's a, there's a difference there. Um, But with the ESAs, we see like more room for abuse. What about aggressive breeds? So I've had some communities where they say we get it, but why does the owner need to have, uh, you know, an emotional support pit bull as opposed to an emotional support right. chihuahua? So what's the answer to that? The answer to that is that HUD believes that the person who is making the request has the best knowledge about what type of animal that they would require and that will help them the best. So if they say they need a pit bull, then they need a pit bull. And we cannot force them. We cannot deny requests based on size, weight, breed. Um, I, I have a client right now who's defending a HUD complaint because they wouldn't allow a pit bull. And it, it, this usually happens in Miami because Miami is one of the only places that has a ban on pit bulls. But um, you, you can't. Then there's case law out there from the Southern District of Florida that says pit, pit bulls are permitted. I was just going to ask you that if what if there's a local ordinance that bans a particular aggressive breed? So you're saying the federal law is going to override that and the disabled person, if he or she has otherwise met the legal litmus test for that accommodation, can have it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's my yeah, I think Miami's been trying to overturn that ban for quite some time, but it just never passes. You know, I, I sometimes feel bad for these animals. I mean, you talk about a mastiff in a small apartment in a multifamily building. It just, it just sometimes doesn't make sense to me. We had a request one time for two huge pot-bellied pigs um, <laughs> in a high rise on the beach. And, it, you know, we did say that was unreasonable. I mean, all these requests do need to be reasonable, but two huge uh, pot-bellied pigs. Could you imagine getting into an elevator with two pot-bellied pigs? Or- no, and I feel bad for the pot-bellied pigs. That's right. what I'm saying. Have you ever seen those cartoons where the, the emotional support animal can't take it anymore? <laughs> <laughs> it's, just too, it's just too heavy a lift. Right. The emotional support <laughs> animal needs the support animal. I had that once. I had a, a, well, you know, I've had that a couple times where people have said that they have one animal, but then the animal's depressed. Yes. Now let me ask you that. Can, can, can somebody come forward and say, I need two because my other animal is depressed and needs an animal? No. Okay. And <laughs> we have to accommodate humans. We don't have to accommodate the animals yet. Um, that's probably on the horizon, but um, at this point in time, we can say, you know, there needs to be an individual need or independent need for each animal that a person seeks a request to have. So it just because the other animal is depressed and requires an animal doesn't, doesn't meet the test. Okay. So we haven't used the, those, those uh, magic words, reasonable accommodation. So that's what they're really asking for. They're saying, I know you have a, pet, a no pet rule or you have a pet limitation. Let's say one dog, 20 pounds or, or, or fewer uh, or less. And I want my my emotional support pit bull. What is a reasonable accommodation? What does that mean? It means, and generally speaking, the case law says that um, requests for accommodations for animals are are going to generally be considered reasonable in pretty much every uh, you know any every portion of these. Um, but it, again, it, it's the reasonable part. You know, so if you have an aggressive animal or an animal that has bitten someone, has nipped, those are the times that we can take action and say, yeah, you might be entitled to an animal, but maybe not this this particular animal. What about barking all night? Would that be unreasonable? It's a nuisance. Every Absolutely. all these communities have a nuisance provision. <clears throat> Absolutely, and that's one of the the biggest you know, complaints that we get are the dog is barking. The dog is barking. It won't stop barking. It's been barking all night. Um, and, and like we were just talking about when people go to work and their emotional support animal is in the unit and they're, 
the animal's upset or, you know, separation anxiety, whatever the case might be, and it's barking all day long, um, that can be very problematic. And then in those situations, we give them uh, an opportunity to cure and then let them know that if that animal continues to bark and the nuisance continues, that we're going to have to with, withdraw our approval. I was on a plane once. There were three animal, three dogs on this plane, and they all started barking at each other. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> and I was thinking to myself, this is actually probably making other people depressed, having to deal or anxious, probably anxious more than more than anything else. Um, what about the owner failing to pick up after the animal? You know, that's, that's a problem also, as long as the person who's making the request or owns the animal has the ability to clean up after the animal, if they don't, that's also considered a nuisance and is grounds for withdrawing an approval. Okay. That makes sense. And listen, with the emotional disabilities, with the emotional support animals, we're not usually dealing with a physical infirmity, right? Which would prevent somebody from picking up after their dog. Um, I had one case the, the woman had an ESA. It was a multifamily building, Joanne, and she was on the seventh floor. And the way she let the dog out is she would open her unit door and the dog would relieve itself in the hallway. Oh, <laughs> yes, we, we did. We did revoke that. So reasonable accommodations can be revoked. I believe um, this happened about a year and a half ago. And yeah, we went back and, and actually she filed a complaint with the, the fair housing agency and she lost, uh, they had video of her doing it. And, and uh, yeah, it, the building was in quite the uproar. We had that with a cat in, in a building as well. And the cat, they would just open up their door and the cat would run up and down the hallway and and not just to use the restroom, but kind of for daily activity. (laughs) Well, you can't look, the cat was probably bored. As we said earlier, the cat was, was probably carrying a heavy, uh, a heavy burden taking care of the owner. Um, (laughs) What about walking? You know, I get this question a lot too. Can anybody walk in the, does it have to be the disabled person walking the service animal or the ESA? It does not have to be that person, but for the most part, if you have an emotional support animal, the emotional support animal should be with the person who requires the animal who is disabled. Um, But there are going to be situations where someone else is going to have to walk the animal or feed the animal or, you know, take it to the vet, whatever the case might be. But for the most part, they should be with their owner. So for communities that charge like a pet registration fee or a fee for a little tag, can they apply those fees to service animals and emotional support animals? No, absolutely not. Can't require insurance, can't charge a pet fee, pet deposit, um, because they're not considered pets. They're considered, you know, uh, like I said, consider them like a wheelchair or something like that. An extension of their disabled humans. Yeah. And you know what tends to happen, Joanne, is when we've got communities with these fees. And by the way, the airlines saw this too. I don't want to pay the fee for my pet. Oh, I don't have to pay the fee for my assistance animal. This is an assistance animal now. Right. And that's right. what and that's what tends to happen. I mean, if you can get it through, depending, listen, a lot of these fees are are, are, are nominal. $50, maybe a hundred. But for some people, you're right. They may say, you know what? It's worth it to it's worth it to say this is an assistant assistance animal. Yeah, and you, you, we have a lot of communities that are near colleges and things like that, and that's where you find that they're trying to that pets are permitted in these communities, but they don't want to pay the pet deposit, so they go get the letter online. So, is one solution, Joanne, to maybe rev- for a community to revisit its pet restrictions? For instance, let me give you an example. Got a lot of communities that say we are a no pet community. I said no pets, no pets at all, no pets. You sure there's not a goldfish in a goldfish bowl in one of these units? Are you sure there's not a hamster running around on a hamster wheel? Well, then they say, well, now that you say that, well, those are pets, aren't they? So if you categorize yourself as a completely pet free community, don't you have to make sure that that's really the case in order yes. to enforce it? Definitely, definitely. And, and a lot of times we'll take that into consideration. And when I know when I see our governing documents, they'll say no pets except fish in, you know, an aquarium, uh, birds in cages or something like that. But yes, you want to make sure that you definitely are enforcing your, your pet restriction and that you have an enforceable pet restriction. 
So, Joanne, how do we do that? I mean, we have a do we have an annual pet audit where we knock on all the doors? I mean, listen, <laughs> I can I can I can uh, smuggle a hamster in or a, a small turtle, even a snake at night, you know. And it, who's watching? So, unless we go into these units, how do we actually do this? Um, it's usually by word of mouth. Someone's going to complain. Someone's going to see something. But if they don't, the association is unaware of it. Then they tip, they really are enforcing their pet restriction. They have to be on notice uh, of the animal being there. I gotcha. So, so sometimes I've I've made this recommendation, and I don't know if I'm making the right recommendation, but I've said, listen, maybe you should loosen up some of your pet restrictions, and that will deter some of the fraud. So, if you're too rigid, you know, no dogs, no no cats, whatever, and people want them, you know, maybe you maybe you'd make a reasonable restriction, one dog or cat in the unit. And maybe that would help. I mean, what do you think about that, that suggestion for some of these communities? <clears throat> in some situations that that might work in some situations where you have people who moved into the community because it was pet restricted, no pets at all. And that's, you know, people with the allergies and the phobias and those kinds of things. Um, it can be very difficult and you may not be able to get it passed in an amendment passed um, permitting animals at all. Do you know way back when the Florida legislature was going to grandfather in pets? I don't know if you knew that along the lines of how they grandfathered in leasing, that you could not change pet restrictions. Same thing, unless existing owners voted yes. That That went down in flames. But it was interesting to me that they wanted to almost make pet ownership a vested right. Wow. Yeah. No, I, I was not aware of that. <laughs> Did I ever tell you my story when I, I represented a couple? Gosh, this had to be, I want to say, 10 years ago. And a man and woman come into my office, and, and, and she needs this emotional support animal, and she's depressed. And I believed it. I you know, And, and the community had a, a no pet restriction. Long story short, you know, I was engaging in a dialogue with the association council, and she gets her dog. And... Um, I thought that was the end of it. I get a call about a month later from the association council. She now has two new dogs and, and she's got them in like a, uh, some sort of like a, one of those like pee pads on the balcony. And it, there's, there's just, a, it's a nuisance. And I, and I reached back out to them and I said, I don't understand. You needed one dog. Why are these other two? Well, my wife wants what she wants was the answer. I went to believe, you know, unless I was there and part of it, but I, I did feel duped, I have to say. I think that happens a lot of times. I really do. Um, I know that when I'm engaging with counsel and we're discussing these situations and I'll bring things up and they'll say, I had absolutely no idea. I did have this, the funniest story that I, that I think I've ever been a part of. I represented an association and a woman wanted her emotional support animal. We went through the process. We approved the animal. It became very aggressive afterward and it bit two or three different people. And so we said, you have to remove that animal from the property. (laughs) She said, okay, I will. The next day she had a new dog and, you know, we're all looking at these pictures. It was the same dog shaved and died. (laughs) I've never heard that story before. (laughs) I couldn't believe it. We were comparing the pictures. I'm like, it's the same dog. (laughs) But she only changed the appearance, not the behavior. It was still the very aggressive dog. Yes. Oh, my goodness. So I find that boards make one of two mistakes. Either they're too easy and they don't want to get into this evaluation process. They don't want to spend the money to send it to their association council to evaluate. So they just rubber stamp all these requests. My first question to you is, How dangerous is it for a board to do that in a pet restricted community to just say, we're just going to grant all these requests? I I think that's a big problem. First of all, you're not enforcing the governing documents. But secondly, you have to hold everyone to the same standard when they're making these requests. So if you do get the big pit bull that you don't want in there, you can't then go and say, well, we're going to hold you to a different standard. We're not going to rubber stamp yours we're going to make you have to jump through the hoops. That's going to be considered discrimination right there. So everyone needs to be treated equally. I tell all my associations, you have an enforceable provision. You need to enforce it. I I couldn't agree more. I mean, that is one of your prime duties as a director is you you can't just say, well, we don't want to spend the money to enforce this. I absolutely agree. Now, conversely, 
How comfortable should a volunteer board member or a manager feel in evaluating uh, an emotional support animal or service animal request on their own and perhaps denying saying? These requests can be landmines. And so it is very important to have counsel or someone review these requests who has knowledge and can try and help you avoid the pitfalls. I, I, I got a lot of requests from managers who are very uncomfortable doing that. They hate to be involved in these requests. And not only because they don't want to make a mistake, but because it also brings the management company into the HUD arena now. I'm going to say I received probably seven HUD complaints this week alone, and every one of them named the management company as well. It can be difficult. Mm -hmm. You just such a perfect segue, Joanne. So walk us through a complaint process. Clearly, the the person does not meet um, the legal litmus test. The, The request is denied. I would say more often than not, right, that person then says, I'm going to file a complaint. What happens next? They file with HUD or with uh, Florida Commission on Human Relations. You'll receive the complaint in the mail, and it gives you 10 days to respond. So there's a very short window of time. The first thing the association should do is notify counsel and notify their insurance carriers immediately to see if a defense will be provided. The investigator then will conduct interviews with the different parties and will determine whether or not they believe there's cause um, to believe discrimination actually occurred. In your experience, Joanne, is typically this covered, this kind of complaint, is it covered by the association's insurance? These days, yes. Uh, When we first started out doing these about 15 years ago, most of the time they were not covered. But now it seems they're uh, virtually covered in, in almost every case. So from start to finish, how long do, in your experience, do these compl- does the complaint process take? It is supposed to be completed within 100 days. Uh, it, that just doesn't happen anymore. Uh, I've got some that are pending for over a year now that haven't even been addressed. Depending on how busy that particular local equivalent agency is, um, I know I have one that's been sitting out there for a year and a half, and I've never even gotten a request for an interview. So, and, the, and the animal stays put. If the animal is yes. already in the unit, the animal stays put. If it was a potential uh, tenant or a potential purchaser, then they may have moved on right. to another community. What are the possible penalties and fines? At the HUD level, the only thing that can be done there is a voluntary payment, settlement payment. For the most part, it's just going to be a finding of cause or a finding of no cause to believe discrimination occurred. But from there, it can escalate. If there is a finding of cause, the state can then bring an action on behalf of the aggrieved person. And that that complaint is brought free of charge. The entire lawsuit is, is brought in their name, but free of charge. And it's the association then that has to defend. Wow. And what if the association su- defends successfully? There's a finding of no discrimination. Can the association recoup their attorney's fees and costs? No. Definitely not at the HUD level. And quite frankly, at the in, in court, it, generally, you're not going to recover fees there either. This is why you want to get it right from the beginning. Exactly. Getting, back to your, getting back to your other point, right? Absolutely. Engage in the interactive process. Avoid the word deny. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. nothing off the cuff here. Um, So a lot of people have the misconception, Joanne, that that these um, protective laws uh, apply only to residents or owners. That's not the case. This applies to tenants, guests, visitors. Can you talk a little bit about that? It definitely applies to everyone. It's hard to enforce in terms of guests. You're going to have someone show up at the property with their animal and you know, I'm here to visit Jane Doe and Unit 101. And are you going to turn that person away? Or how are you going to address that? And what I usually advise clients to do is maybe permit the animal that first time, but let them that person know that until the they provide proper documentation, and the animal is approved in the future, the animal can't come back. And tenants, what about, uh, well, here, I do this a lot. I've got communities that say in there, they've got lease addenda and they don't want tenants to have pets. That's okay. But then a tenant may say, this isn't a pet. This is my emotional support animal. Right. And you would, the association would need to evaluate that just like they would an owner's request for an accommodation. 
This is very complicated, Joanne. It gets- <laughs> <laughs> this can get this can get very very complicated very very quickly. It, it can, and especially with requests for multiple animals, they get so, complicated. So I had I'm, I'm just going to keep throwing my examples at you. I had a case where um, a couple uh, husband dies. It was his emotional support animal. Can the animal stay? Wife wanted to wanted the unit uh, the unit wanted the dog to stay in the unit. Possible. It's possible. Generally speaking, we would say that the animal, the re- the request for an accommodation is is withdrawn. The approval of the request is withdrawn. You're not the disabled individual. But it always turns out that right after that, that person makes a request for an accommodation based Which, on their own right, disability. And in, right. And in, in the case of bereavement, that mm-hmm. makes sense that right. now the person, the surviving spouse is, is depressed. And by the way, I know you and I share the same philosophy that there are cases where these animals are truly needed. Yeah. Absolutely. My brother-in-law, in fact, has an emotional support animal. He has severe PTSD and I've seen it with my own eyes. The animal, you know, definitely calms him down, definitely helps him, allows him to sleep when he otherwise wouldn't. Yeah. And, and, and so so in those cases, I know I've talked to people who are in need of these animals and they are very, very vocal about their dismay over the fraud because it's the fraud that makes it hard for people who truly need these animals um, to get them. So we're going to talk about fraud. So Florida made fraudulent ESA and fraudulent service animal requests a crime. And, and, you know, we've got people listening from all over. There may be other states that are going to follow suit. And I know questions were raised. Well, how can a, how can a state pass a law when this is a federal law? I want you to talk about that. And also has anyone actually been prosecuted under these laws? Yeah, to my knowledge, I have not heard of anyone being prosecuted under the law. And this started out with a service animal statute, 413.08, subsection 9, I think it is. And that's been on the books for a while. And I've never heard of anyone being prosecuted under that. So this new statute that went into effect about a year ago, I have not heard anything about that. But have these have the laws in Florida that criminalize these fraudulent requests? Has it had an impact on? on I mean, have have some of the requests um, slowed down when they're told that it's a crime? Do some of them go away? Have you seen any impact? Yes, I, I, and I let people know when I receive certain letters that I, like I said, I can usually identify those very quickly. I let them know about the statutes and make sure that they're fully aware that if they submit additional documentation. It, it needs to comply. It needs to be reliable. And that perhaps they have violated that statute already. You know, I see in the stores, they've got the, um, they cite the, st- the Florida statute that, you know, only legitimate service animals are permitted. And I, and I saw that, you know, I've seen an increase in those kind of notices over the last, I want to say five or six years. What about the people who are writing the letters? Can they possibly possibly be prosecuted under these laws? Yes, and there, the statute went into effect at the same time that says that if a medical professional writes a letter that they know to be false or that's not that doesn't come from personal knowledge, that that their license could be put in jeopardy. Well, I think that has to happen. I, I will tell you, I went online, and you know, some of these providers, you take a quiz. There's no way, and no matter how you answer these questions, Joanne, you are in need of an emotional support animal. I took the quiz four different ways, answered four different times, and every time the result was, you need an emotional support absolutely, animal. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, click here, pay here, click here, and print it out. So I think, you know, the word has to get out to some of those online providers that this is in some states, and, I, and I'm sure Florida's not the only state, and we may be an example for other states that may decide to also criminalize these requests. Definitely. There are so many of these places out there. There is an agency that is dedicated to using physicians only to write their letters. And they advertise that, you know, this comes from a physician. This is not, um, you know, a therapist or a social worker. When you actually go on their website and do their, their quiz, that's really all it is. No one ever speaks to you. No one ever meets with you. No one sees you. It is literally just a form that you've answered questions online. And within 24 hours, you're going to get your letter. Presto bingo, you get the letter. What about these vests? Okay, with a, cert- with a legitimate service animal, I understand they do, have, they do have the service animal vest. But a lot of people have these emotional support animal vests. 
legitimate? No. They're purchased online from the same place that they purchased the certificate and the ID card that says emotional support animal. So I guess you'd be just as better off just to put your dog, your emotional support animal in a, in a, in a sweater. Yes. It doesn't matter. Yes. The vest is meaningless. I know. And sometimes they will say they have the emotional support animal certificate. Again, a certificate for what? They don't have special training. And there is no recognized animal registry. So these are just online websites that sell, you know, certificates and ID cards and other pretty items that make it look really legit. So Joanne, last question. You've been doing this for a while now. You've established yourself as an expert in this area. As I said at the outset, you're my go-to person. What would you like to see in an ideal world when you've got communities that you're trying to balance competing interests between people who bought thinking, I really don't want to live next to a dog or a cat and people who need these, what would you like to see happen? I would like to see that people who truly require the animals have their animals, but that those people are considerate of the other people who do not want to be around animals. People truly do require these animals and they should be accommodated, but so should people who have allergies and phobias and things like that. It should be an equal balancing where right now I don't think it is. Well, Joanne, thank you so much for joining us on Take It to the Board. And folks, I I hope you take the takeaway here is that uh, this is a complicated area. This is one area where your board doesn't want to go it alone. So reach out and, and, and get some expert advice. Thanks for joining us today. Don't forget to follow us on your favorite podcast platform and leave a review so even more people can take it to the board. Lastly, please visit TakeItToTheBoard.com for more information.